So, I guess Joseph never lived to see the end of that dungeon. That's a shame. On the bright side, he did just get the record for fastest main character death in the series, and for crying out loud, he was the first one to die. And he's got a hell of a record to beat, that's for sure. But, now that we have the Goddess's Bell, we could go to Kashwan Keep, but before we do that, I suppose we do owe it to the people of Salamant, you know, go and tell them that Joseph has passed away. I mean, two or three NPCs talked about him, so he must have been important, and... Of course, he did have a daughter, so I think we need to go and tell her the truth that Joseph died in an incredibly avoidable manner. We could have just ignored Borgen completely and apparently gone around him. That's something we apparently could have done. Or we could have just left as he was telling about us about how he's going to take us with him. We could have, you know, we would have had plenty of time to make it down that staircase. But that's history, as is Joseph, and wait, 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 wait. Y you already knew? You, get, you guys already knew that Joseph was dead. Even though I am the only witness to his death, you already knew that a man in a cave miles away from here was killed before the information could have even possibly reached your brains. For crying out loud, why aren't these guys the main characters? I mean, for crying out loud, they have gossip powers so amazing, they know information they couldn't possibly know. Oh well, whatever. I suppose we should leave this crazy psychic town, even though they sh probably should be the heroes here. I mean, why didn't they predict that the Empire could, you know, take over the entire world? You'd think that information would have reached them. Anyway, we need to go to Basque, because nearby is the path to uh, Kashwan, so I'll meet you over there. Not that it's the biggest walk in the world or anything, but it was still a bit of a distance. Anyway, you want to go south from Basque, and then stick sort of to the east until you find this mountain range. Yeah, this one. Basically, we just have a huge ring of mountains, and uh, I'm pretty sure if you go down or right, it doesn't matter, because the only entrance to the uh, center of these mountains, aside from that little passage that we can't take because it's diagonal, is located to the south. Kashwan's not that hard to find, but it is it is hidden away a little bit, so you, you do be attentive. But before we do that, we actually have a little clearing right there, and that is actually important because it's the first chocobo forest in the series. Coincidentally, it's also the only chocobo forest in this game, and here's the only chocobo in this game. Now, chocobos are really good because they move around the map pretty quickly, but they also avoid all random encounters on the world map, so they're very useful. Uh, unlike certain other chocobos, though, they can't cross rivers, you know, like uh, the chocobo from Final Fantasy V. Yeah, this one can't do that. Regardless, it can still get around pretty well. It can get pretty much anywhere around the world map, really. However, it's not that useful because, again, that's the only chocobo forest in the game, and as such, it's more time efficient to just go somewhere even with the enemy encounters because you have to come all the way out to this remote location just to get a chocobo, just so you can go on without any encounters at a slightly faster pace. So yeah, it's not really that useful, but it does, of course, start the whole chocobo trend, so there's that. Anyway, in case you were wondering why I didn't drop everything to talk about these goblin princes, it's because they're just as impressive as the goblin guards. Their stat upgrades are, well, mediocre, so they're probably gonna die in one hit still. And the only thing they really have, you know, other than that mediocre stat upgrade, I believe is... Pretty much just the ability to use the sleep spell, which isn't really that threatening anyway, especially if you have high magic defense, so you can just ignore those guys. Anyway, the Sunfire's right here, but of course, I I think you know by now that we can't just pick up the Sunfire, because, you know, if we could, we would have gone right here when we Hilda told us about it. But we have to take the Goddess's Bell to open this door, and with that... We can now pass through to Kashwan Keep proper, and here we actually find Gordon. And because he is royalty to Kashwan, he could actually open that door without the goddess bell, so had he stayed in town, and you know, we'd met him in town, we could have just come straight here, and he could have opened the door, and we could have come straight here without getting Joseph killed, but unfortunately, he had enough character development to come all the way out here, but he didn't actually have enough to take on the keep and all of its hordes of monsters, so... There is that. Oh, curse you, half-character development. Could have been full-character development, but no. Anyway, 
regardless, Gordon joins us by this point, and now it should be kind of obvious that, uh, the fourth character slot in this game, yeah, characters kind of dart in and out of it, so there's not really that huge a point in actually training up characters. I mean, the three main characters are usually strong enough where they can kill things on their own. They don't need a fourth person. If you want to train someone, it's really more for their own survival rather than the survival of the main party. Like Gordon here, his stats are pretty shit starting out. He's kind of similar to Furion in that he's more of a balanced character, you know. Men was made for white magic, Joseph was made for punching things, or axing things. That, that was also quite effective, I think. Gordon here can, can go either way. He's good with strength and magic. Uh, I'm just giving him miscellaneous spells, just to clear out my inventory, really. I don't, I don't plan on really using him as a mage or much of anything, really, I mean. I could go out and train him, but, eh, honestly, there's not much of a point. He does start out very weak, but, eh, I don't really see him. I don't really see me caring enough about him to really train him. I, know, I might do that in between parts, but who knows. Anyway, yeah, this sergeant, remember we saw him at Semit Falls, he was the boss? It hasn't been that long since Semit Falls, so he can still be kinda tough. His defense is still fairly good, but his HP is not amazing by this point, so taking him out shouldn't be too bad. I mean, if you want to take him out fast, just use magic. Sergeants, of course, are nowhere near as bad as captains, and it, you should be able to kill captains by this point, so if you can kill them, you can kill the sergeants. Anyway, uh, this area, Kashwan Keep, uh, it's decent design-wise. I think I like the Ice Cavern more than it in most ways. I mean, the design, it looks, eh, it looks decent. The art's Alright, I mean, the destroyed castle is kind of a recurring motif in this game. Not necessarily for dungeons, but it is a repeated location. You know, enemies in it or not. Uh, speaking of enemies, we're rats here. Stat-wise, not impressive. They can, however, cause poison with their basic attack, so be careful of that. Anyway, yeah. Design-wise, this area can be kinda cheap for, you know, reasons I'll discuss not too long later. But, uh, oh. We actually have some tough enemies here. These guys are actually notable. Ogres, of course, are fairly tough, just, you know, strength-wise, they can punch you fairly well. They've got some decent HP, but Ogre Mages are actually pretty strong in that they have a good number of spells. I believe they have Blind, Blizzard, Sleep, and Blink. So they actually have a pretty good spell list. But since it's only one of those guys and an Ogre, they weren't really too hard to take down. Uh, the Ogre Mage, though, if it's paired up with enemies that are in front of it and, you know, decently powerful, or basically if it has a good wall, it can actually be a good support for the enemies. It's nothing amazing, but still. You know, I'm actually getting some fairly decent equipment, which uh, kind of sucks because I went out and bought stuff for Gordon beforehand, so yeah, that was kind of a waste. But he does get some pretty good equipment. I'm, I'm fairly sure uh, stuff like the golden equipment is actually pretty good for him. In fact, I think... I think this actually prevent poison, the uh, golden equipment. It might be the gold uh, armor or the shield, but one of them does that, I think. Not 100% sure on that, though. Since I haven't mentioned it yet, the battle background for this area, I don't actually care for that one much either. I mean... I think it's just the fact that the colors are kind of washed out. See? Oh, and uh, Adamantoises coming back pretty fast. I mean, they were in the mini boss. They were the mini boss last time, so he could still be fairly tough. But again, a good Blizzard spell will take care of him pretty quickly. And anyway, back to the uh, battle background. Yeah, as you can see, it's it's a little washed out color-wise, and I don't know. It's just it's not amazing. It's not that interesting. So. Art-wise, this area isn't too impressive, nothing really stands out, though the layout actually kind of reminds me of the uh, Temple of Chaos from the first game, just because it's, you know, sort of, sort of a squarish shape, and I think I'm going the wrong way, and, uh, what a coincidence, because I think this is actually where I uh, bring up the cheap portions of this, and hey, Wraiths! So, we already have those uh, previous little, uh, I forget what their uh, previous versions were called, these guys are actually a decent upgrade, because... As you saw there, they do drain HP with their attacks every time. Thankfully, though, their attack power isn't all that high, which does prevent them from being more dangerous than they actually are. You can usually do a lot more damage than, you know, they can heal themselves with. 
fact, you'll generally kill them one in one hit if you're not doing too badly. So they're not too bad, but their large groups can be annoying. Especially since, even if, you know, they're not draining that much HP from you, it's still time-consuming because, you know, you gotta wait for both numbers to come up. I don't know, there's, there's just something slow to these battles, I think. I don't know, it could just be me, because it's not like the numbers come up, you know, one after another, like you get hit and then they heal. No, both numbers come up at once, so... I don't know, just something feels really slow about these fights to me, I don't know. It, again, it just could be me, I don't know, I might, I might be crazy. But anyway, as I was saying before, design-wise, as in layout, don't care for this, because as you can see, yeah, we actually had to go into a door for these items, which is kind of cheap, because, of course, the game just, you know, there were all those door mazes before, like in Senate Falls, that sort of teach the player not to actually enter a door unless they're absolutely sure it's the only way to go. Oh, look, it's a tortoise. These guys are really weak. If you can take out an Animantois, these land this land turtle shouldn't be a problem. <sighs> Which, of course, it is called a turtle. Or it's called a tortoise, not a turtle. It's, it's, it's tortoise, Square Enix. Just get through that through your head. Tortoise, land, turtle, water. <sighs> but anyway, yeah. As I was saying, the game sort of teaches you to, you know, not go into doors unless absolutely necessary, but then it places items in the doors just to be a cheap bastard, and usually items that are in, you know, doorways, actually pretty good. We actually got some decent equipment back there, like the Werebuster, and that's actually a pretty good sword. In fact, I think it's better than the sword we got from the uh, dungeon last time, the uh, cursed one, or ancient sword, whatever it's called. Uh, anyway, these mine enemies, these are some rare versions of the uh, balloon enemies, they don't really appear that often, but they are really tough. They have some good HP and defense, meaning they can actually tank quite a few hits before going down, and of course, since they can, you know, use self-destruct, that is pretty dangerous, so this is clever design. I'm pretty sure these guys are actually weak to fire, which is kind of weird given later in the series these guys are considered fire elementals. In this game, I'm pretty sure they're weak to fire, they don't absorb it, which is kind of throws me off, really. That's why I don't like using magic and gets them all that much, because, you know, I think it's going to heal them. But regard... Oh, jeez, yeah, self-destruct 5. Hopefully... Oh, wow, that only did 28 damage. I forget the formula that's used to calculate the damage for self-destruct, so I couldn't tell it to you, but apparently, yeah, it doesn't result in much damage, so I guess those guys aren't as dangerous as I said they were. Anyway, let's start equipping stuff to Gordon, since I haven't really been doing that so far. Been bad about that, honestly. And I believe we have to go and... Yep, more items. Of course, these are just status effect healing items. You know, relatively good status effect healing items. But regardless, still kind of cheap. But you could miss out on that, and, you know, you're, you wouldn't be missing too much. Werebuster, though, is a bit more useful. This door, it's pretty obvious, you need to go into, and here we actually have the boss. Indeed, it's a red soul. Now, this guy isn't too bad, however, do not use any magic against it, because it can absorb every element of magic you have, and since you don't have any sort of element list magic in the game so far, yeah, you just have to stick with physical attacks. Luckily, though, there is one huge weakness that the Red Soul has. It only has 30 MP, and given all its spells are level 8, it's got three uses of magic before it resorts to its, you know, pitiful physical attack. It's not really that bad, especially if you can survive level 8 spells without, you know, too much of a problem like me. I'm, I'm barely taking any damage from this guy, so... Taking him down shouldn't be too much of a problem, though he does have a decent defense for a boss who can only melee, so I guess he has that, but again, he's completely useless after three spells, so it doesn't make that much of a difference anyway. And he's already dead because Max is OP. And with this, we get Edgel's Torch. Now, there's no actual teleporter in this dungeon, so we're just gonna have to use the teleport spell, because I'm not walking back through this entire dungeon, because that just sounds annoying. So, let's just warp out, heal Link, since this spell saps the life of its user. Should be good enough. 
And with this, we can go and get some Sunfire with Edgel's Torch. And there we go. Alright, so with this, we actually have the power to destroy the Dreadnought. So I guess now we should go find Sid's ship and... Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. You should probably know that the Emperor really likes Star Wars. Hmm. That's less than ideal.